Welcome to the Primary Sources Podcast. My name is Joanne Paul, and I'm here to chat with some of the world's leading historians, not just about what they do, the histories they study, the stories they tell, but how they do it, and for goodness sake, why they do it. I'm interested in motivations and approaches, and how they came to find themselves buried in the past in the first place. Today, I am very excited to welcome to the podcast an absolute podcast master herself, Helen Carr. Helen is well known for her work on various historical programs, uh, especially History Hit amongst others, as well as her own research, which has just come out or will have just come out, uh, The Red Prince, a biography of John of Gaunt. She's also a great friend, um, and we're doing a bit of podcast trading here as we recorded for Helen's Hidden, Hidden Histories a few weeks ago. Thank you so much, Helen, for taking the time to speak with us. Oh, thank you for having me. How are you doing? I feel like that's a really important question to ask these days. How are things? <laughs> yeah, busy. I'm, I'm, I'm releasing the book next week, so I am incredibly busy trying to do all of the press stuff around that. So various podcasts, I'm doing a talk this evening. Um, I'm having to sign lots of things. It's, it's a bit manic and I'm really looking forward to a holiday, but it's also very fun. So, and good. so that's good. <laughs> and that's kind of the point of, of, um, completing a book is this bit that it's busy, but it's fun. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're one of those who's actually been quite busy and productive in lockdown. You're one of those. <laughs> yeah. There's not been okay. much choice. It's kind of like I have had pretty much had the sword of Damocles over my head, so I haven't exactly been able to be not productive. Yeah, and we're not. I'm not sure when this comes out whether your book will already be out, um, but we will say more about um, the Red Prince in a little bit. Um, I usually like to start uh, my questions at the beginning uh, and ask where the love of history started uh, for the guests that I have on, um, but I suspect it might be a bit of a different story for you um, because you have this immense family legacy uh, when it comes uh, to history, being the great granddaughter of the uh, wonderful E.H. Carr. Was it that family connection that fostered the love of history for you or did you have a love of history and then realize that you had this, this family legacy as well? Yeah, it's, you know, it's really hard to work out what came first. It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So my earliest memories, childhood memories, were loving history and being fascinated with history and telling my parents that I wanted to be all sorts of various um, historian-esque style careers. So, you know, at one point I wanted to be an archaeologist and I wanted to be um, a historian or a librarian maybe at one point. That didn't last that long. Um, but, but yeah, I was always aware um, the, the, about E.H. Carr. Um, there was definitely a sort of familial legacy on my dad's side. And I do remember very, very young looking, being shown a family tree um, on the floor of my grandparents' living room. And um, I remember being very excited by that. And my dad used to take me out on Saturdays because my parents were, were divorced from when I was quite little. So he had Saturdays with me. And having a young child myself, I know how difficult it is to occupy a child for entire days. That's like quite a task. And you have to plan so hard what you're gonna do. So, you know, when you get a bit sick of doing another movie or another day at the swimming pool, he he sort of broadened his horizons and started taking me to places like castles and mounds and burial sites and churches and cathedrals. And so one of my earliest memories is going to Fotheringhay Castle and being fascinated where uh, Mary Queen of Scots had her head cut off which is quite macabre for a young child, but there you go. And so we used to go to Fotheringhay quite regularly. And I used to love just walking around the site and trying to reimagine what the past would have looked like. Um, and then that kind of endured throughout my childhood. And I started to become more aware when I was at school of who E.H. E. Carr was. I never read What is History until much later on. But, um, <laughs> but I did understand that he was a well-known historian and, and I started to invest in the idea of the past and um, and what it meant to try and reimagine the past and what it would have looked like, felt like. Um, 
And then, yeah, like anybody as well, you know, I always loved historical movies, historical fiction. My ways in were, there were so many of them, but I definitely, my whole life, I have lived and breathed history. That's wonderful. It's interesting you were saying too about um, visiting the castles and sort of walking in the steps of, of people in the past, because of course your podcast, Hidden Histories, is about visiting locations. Yeah. Um, which is until, shorter, until quite recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it was like, let's just talk about history. Yeah. <laughs> um, you said you, you read What is History sort of later on um, in, in your studies, I, I guess. You know, it's still the thing that every first year undergraduate history student reads. Did it impact your, your own approach as a historian? Yeah, it did. It's been one of those books that I think I've had to return to. I don't think I really understood it when I first read it. Um, I think many students could probably identify with that. It's quite complicated. It's quite a, um, it's quite an advanced school of thought. I think you have to be taught it quite carefully if you're quite young. And I'm say when I say quite young, I even mean undergraduate. Um, I think you need to be guided through it because there's a lot of um, thought process. It's quite complicated in places. He's carrying an argument through with quite a lot of detail. Um, and there's so many different threads of thought that are sort of firing off. So I, I've cut, it's something that I've come back to. And I actually would say now it's something that if you are interested in history, if people are interested in history, just have it on your shelf and don't feel you have to read it all at once. Kind of take it piece by piece. It's, it's a very short book. It was based on a series of lectures, but it's definitely not something that you need to um, that you need to read and fully absorb and understand in one go. I think it's one of those books that you can return to. When you've produced a bit of uh, uh, something, your own your own return to it, um, you've, you've produced a, a volume as well. And, and, and we will we will come come back to that. Um, I want to uh, come back to this idea of, of uh, really sort of loving history and 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 it always being um, throughout your career uh, a sort of a central thread for you because you've done a lot of work producing historical TV and radio as well um, in our time uh, history hit uh, various programs on most of the TV channels that are out there um, do you find that you have a different approach to history when you're working on shows like these as opposed to when you're doing your own research and writing or or is it does it all come from the same place hmm. yeah that's an interesting question i think you have to when you're producing you have to look at things very differently you have to look at them very technically you have to think about what's available to to see it's very visual so you know you might have this great narrative thread in something or there's this great uh, school of thought or argument but if you've got nothing to demonstrate that um, that's very difficult to convey on a on a on a screen. So, what it has made me do is really learn to dig archivally. Like I think actually in some ways more so than academic work I've done because, you know, ac academic work it might be digitized. It might be you you're often you've got all these sources at your fingertips um, that are that are online. Um, and I I have to as a producer go and actually find these original sources and also it's you know it's quite you, you academics or myself will often say oh yes there there's a you know there's there's talk of a letter in this in this source okay there's there's somebody that talks of a letter and then you'll get the the director going i need to see that letter and you're like well i don't think it exists and they're like can you find it it's like no i'm not i'm sure it doesn't exist can you find the letter so you're then sent into this archive and my goodness you are, it is like a baptism of fire when you're creating a documentary because you are trying to find something that is visual the whole time, which I think can really open up doors as to, as to sort of ways of researching when you're doing it as a scholar. Um, so you might be looking for something as a scholar and you're like, it, it just, it's not there, I can't find that. But if you're going in from a production perspective, you're, look, you're just looking for something that cannot that can lead you down like a rabbit warren so i guess in some ways it works in tandem but in other ways it's quite different because you're constantly looking for this tangible thing to be able to represent the story but it's also got to be told in a very um, popular way so in a way that people understand so in in some ways it's more dependent on 
and I realize I'm name dropping the name of the podcast in the in primary sources, um, mm -hmm. then then um, you know uh, writing writing a book might be because I can depend on a secondary source, yeah. Um, yeah. or I can depend on the work of other historians, but that isn't as as visual visual and as you say tangible as mm -hmm. having that that letter or that archival piece of whatever it might be that that you can you can show on on a television program. I think the difference, yeah, totally. I think the difference with TV is it's a case of serious primary research. And I think that's something that people don't really realise when you're putting a history yeah. documentary together. You become sort of an expert within six months of something because you're sort of in you're you're so deep in it and you're researching, you're speaking to, to real experts. Um, and but you're also deep in the archives trying to find things that tell this story. I think the difference that comes is there's there's less of that critical thought. You're really just using something as evidence and saying this tells this basic story rather than kind of deep going into that very academic scholarly way of thinking is, OK, but what are the various interpretations of this? As you say, you've you've been sort of that that six month expert um, for for a variety of of topics now. Um, but for your own research, you've chosen the medieval period. Why? <laughs> what what drew you out of all these various things that that you have you have studied and that you've worked on and that you've talked to people about? Why the Middle Ages? Yeah, I you know what I don't really know, and I bet you when you ask more historians like this, they'll go, I don't know. I just sort of <laughs> fell into it. But I think so. My first. I've always been interested in quite uh, old history. I've never been interested in modern history. That's not something that's really piqued my, I don't know, it's just not inspired me in the same way. Um, so when I was an undergrad at York, I used to work for the York Archaeological Trust. Um, I used to take people around various um, archaeological excavations, looking at the Viking remains, looking at some medieval remains. York itself is a very med medieval city. Um, I... I was very inspired by the sort of architecture there. Um, but I was also studying history of art. And weirdly, I did both a course in medieval art and I looked at some of the Anglo-Saxon stuff. But I also really fell into it, funnily enough, through Victorian art because the sort of gothic revival of the Victorian period was very invested in the Middle Ages. And I found that fascinating. And I guess there's this sense of chivalry and romanticism that is evoked within these 19th century paintings, the pre-Raphaelites, for example. Um, I remember really loving that and just finding it very beautiful. Um, so I suppose that was one of the ways in. Um, and then later on, I just found myself becoming more and more interested in this notion of of chivalry and battle and the Hundred Years' War and the conflict that was going on um, during the 14th century, 13th, 14th, even into the 15th centuries. Um, and then more specifically, I went back to do a master's in medieval history to be focused on John of Gaunt and the Savoy Palace because it was the landscape um, and then in the indelible fabric of, of the city of London, when I moved to London and I'm in my early 20s, that really inspired me to try and dig into to the past of the city more. So, again, it's a lot about sort of location and, and your own experience um, being woven into the, the research um, that, that you do. Um, your uh, part of this work is is the PhD that you're doing um, at Queen Mary University of London, my own alma mater as well, on women's emotional responses to the Black Death in the 14th century. Yeah. Does your own experience <laughs> as a woman living through a pandemic um, bring anything to to your study? Is it is it is it too close to home? Is it is it is it um, is there some overlap there? Are, are you able to? understand your subjects a little bit better because you know we're in we're in a very a similar experience but we're in the experience of of a pandemic totally and what's ironic about all of this is i actually came up with this phd proposal um two years ago so <laughs> until i remember talking to you about it then yeah. um so to go then live through it is a bit weird um so I have, I fairly recently started the PhD. I deferred it for a long time because I was busy finishing the book. But what inspired me to look into this was because as many clerical accounts of women um, are from this period, particularly 14th, 15th, to be honest, even throughout history, women were not favoured by clerics. 
Um, they I, women were described around the period of the of the Black Death as acting strangely, um, acting with a sense of madness, um, acting unholy, um, you know, being particularly. Um, <laughs> I don't know, a particularly excited, going a bit mad. And I found that really strange. And I thought, where has this come from? Because I know that the that the Black Death to, to some scholars has been a sort of, um, was a sort of liberation for women because many men died and women were starting to take up jobs as brewers and armourers. Uh, so I just started to become interested as to what the response was. And also when I, when I started a family, I realised the emotional impact that losing your loved ones especially little children would have on women and I just couldn't get my head around this sense of loss and so I wanted to understand how women did respond to that sort of of loss um that level that scale of loss in in the 14th century it's almost inevitable loss of a member of your family so how have I it's it feels so different in a way that this pandemic has has not affected it's it, there is a certain demo, there's a certain demographic of people that this pandemic has affected there's a certain age group this pandemic has affected not that that is sort of separating the sense of grief but it's but for me i think the difference between the plague is there was nobody that was unaffected by this it really was absolutely ev- anybody and, and everybody could have lost their life and many many did they think you know up to even 60 percent of the population so i found that it is quite different in that respect but what i have thought about and dwelled on is this idea of how one changes and emerges as a society from such catastrophe um and this huge sense of social shift and the way that we work in particular so you know looking at the way people were locating to London and relocating to London trying to be within the hub of commerce and industry in a way that they weren't so much before the whole idea that the uh the 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 serfdom was effectively wiped out by the by the black death so that's a whole class level that has effectively become um non-existent after this and then we're looking at the way we work now so the idea of working from home and the idea of not having such a sense of presenteeism in an office for some people that has been difficult but for other people that's been incredibly liberating so it's interesting to look at you know not look at it in such a kind of bleak way sometimes but understand how do we emerge from something like this and how do we reshape ourselves and our society and what the fallout would be and I think you could look to the 14th century and the consequences of the Black Death to gain a level of understanding as to what we might be looking at in the future. There's a sort of hopeful message there about thinking about what what comes what comes next. Yeah and the and the idea of progression and how that progression is going to happen the speed of such progression how um other other people other I, I you know other demographics are going to find it quite challenging to accept that progression how working how the working world is going to change so how companies are going to have to accept that now people are going to say well actually I've got three children at school and it's worked really well for me to pick them up so you're going to have to accept because I've proved to you over the last year <laughs> that I can work from home. So it's going to be interesting to see how the I think how the um you know, the, 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 the big shot companies and the people who have never had to really worry about management of day-to-day life, how they're going to make the, the change. From plague and pandemic to a prince, um, you have just published or are about to publish um, a biography of John of Gaunt, uh, The Red Prince. What is it about John of Gaunt that drew you to want to write his biography? Yeah, so uh, going back to this idea of kind of walking through history a little bit, like when I when I moved to London, I was 20, I was working in antiques and I was um, in my early 20s. And again, really fascinated with the whole um, medieval period. And I remember these um, these uh, 
shields coming in. They were like heraldic devices coming in on a to, to have a look at in this antique place that I went. And just being totally fascinated by it. Um, and so I was interested from that point, very much during the medieval period. And I remember on my days off, weekends, um, those free weekends that we used to have, um, <laughs> trying to, to, to explore London a little bit. It was the first time I'd really lived there. Um, so I did things like I went to the Tower of London and I spent like a creepily long amount of time um walking around the tower of london yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i was just i guess i googling all these different like uh, palaces and things that you could that you could visit and i was particularly interested as in what was surviving in london i wasn't so interested in the you know very um maintained places like hampton court it was more what is kind of crumbling what's surviving in its most original form that's not sort of um i guess cosseted in tourism but is something that I can just walk around just sort of me like mentally reconstruct in some way so I read about the Savoy Palace and I was like oh my god this place sounds amazing it's like Camelot on the side of the Thames and it's got glowing sandstone walls and it's crenellated and it's got a drawbridge and then I was like okay that's cool I'm gonna go find it and uh, uh, I mean stupidly it's like <laughs> of course it's not there anymore but I think I understood that it wouldn't wholly be there um, but I thought there'd be something, but there's really nothing. I think there's like some foundations underneath the Savoy Chapel. But what's really cool is the fact that it's replaced by the Savoy Hotel, which is kind of like a 20th century version <laughs> of what the Savoy Palace would have been. And then there are all these roads around the Savoy Hotel and all of these like little mem like memories and uh, mem like Sorry, I'll do that again. There are all these places around the Savoy Hotel that are reminiscent of what was there. And so when you just step outside the hotel itself, you go on for like streets and there's still Savoy Lane, Savoy Street, Savoy Corner. And it's kind of like, OK, how big was this place? So I started to do my research and I found out it was massive. It's like, OK, well, when did it? When did it crumble? What happened? And then I found out the story behind the fall of the Savoy. And I found that fascinating. And I then got into the Peasants' Revolt and, you know, the politics behind the Peasants' Revolt. And then the Savoy Palace, who owned the Savoy Palace, John of Gaunt, started reading about him, somebody that I recognised his name, like everybody recognises John of Gaunt's name, but nobody really knows what he did. No clue, no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he's like, but that's the point. He's everywhere. In England, yeah. in France, even in Spain, he's absolutely everywhere. So my way in was really to go, OK, well, I want to understand why the Savoy Palace was destroyed and why was it never rebuilt? Because usually, you know, following rebellions, etc., something, a castle like of that level would be repaired. It would be restored and it never was. So I wanted to understand why not and what the what the reasons were. And that's how I got into John of Gaunt, because actually... Just that exploration in itself uh, provided a fascinating character. Um, it was full of emotion and personal reasonings. Um, he, and then I just worked out that he, he himself was really interesting and he changed the course of English and European history. Um, with his with his legacy so that's really what got me into wanting to write about him because i felt he was a very european prince who had he was very forward thinking um but he also had a fascinating life but his life tells the late 14th century it's not just about his experiences it's about what he was involved in and what was going on around him well, now I want to know what happened to the Savoy Palace and why it was rebuilt, <laughs> but I, I understand I've got to wait for the book. Um, so if you're listening and you want to know, make sure you go buy the book. Um, I want to end before we get to our um, quick fire questions. There are quick fire questions um, and, and a few final questions um, by returning um, to what is history. Um, as I mentioned, you're producing a collection with another of our guests, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, titled What is History Now? Yeah, comma which, now. Comma now, <laughs> question mark. Um, <laughs> which uh, updates and expands E.H. Carr's 
work. Um, and if I may quote, um, covering women's history, black history, queer history, disability history, history in the movies, amongst other topics. Mm -hmm. What are your hopes for this volume? First and foremost is the fact that it's readable and people can read it and not feel alienated from history. I think so much of my issue is that I have conversations with bright people, interested people, people who want to learn and inform themselves. And they say things to me like, I just can't get on with history. I can't get on with those dates and all those facts. I just, I just can't really get on with it. And I'm like, but history is such a creative thing. It's, it, this, is, this is not how history should be, should be got on with. When I, when I think of history at, at school and I think about people not getting on with history, inverted commas, I think of that ruler, you know, that ruler that you have with all the kings, kings and a few queens on it. And it's we had prime ministers, but yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> prime ministers, <laughs> yeah. like whatever it is, battles, ruler, yeah. the ruler yeah. of battles, the ruler most, of kings. Most, mostly white men, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, of course that's going to be boring to some people because it just feels like a series of accepted facts. And the issue here is there is so much of history that is that is constantly being rewritten, reinterpreted, which is the whole point of what is history, what is history, is the idea that history is interpretation. There is no such thing as objective history. And I very much stand by that. And I think any historian genuinely who is worth their salt would say the same thing. Um, it's and it's true, and you're there nodding furiously because I know that you're in. Yeah, I am. I don't know if you can hear my nodding, but I, I sure, sure am. Yeah. Because history is not. It is not a series of just accepted facts. We have facts, but it's what we do with the facts. It's what we where we choose to look for the facts. Um, it's choosing sections of the fact that suit what we might think and our argument. There's so many different variations, but it's not just about that. This volume in particular is to highlight that all history is relevant and important. So that is the point of highlighting um, these previously marginalised histories, to make people feel like history is for everybody and they all ha everybody has a valid history. And it's really meant to be a way of educating oneself into understanding how to look at history and how to look at the past and especially at the moment i mean it's coming out this year because it's the 60th anniversary of the original book and i had the idea before the toppling of edward colston's statue can you believe it um before um the black lives matter movement before anything like this happened and then it made me realize my goodness this is such an important discussion to be having because you have politicians who are trying to create this sense of a culture war and talk about how we can't rewrite our history. But history is always being rewritten. That's the point. What they're saying is you can't rewrite the history we've written. When, but then who, you know, who owns it? Who is in charge of it? So this, this book is supposed to be an enjoyable, readable which is really important. It's not written for academics, it's written for everyone. Um, it's a readable book about how to understand history and how to reclaim your sense of history. And also highlight, there is no invalid way of, um, of enjoying history. So we talk about history in the movies. I, I used to watch Braveheart and I loved it. <laughs> like, it's full of anachronisms. Mel Gibson in Blue Road, but whatever. It's great. <laughs> like, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with reading um, historical fiction or enjoying Bridgerton. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing that is um, unscholarly about doing that. It's all part of the enjoyment of history and the interpretation of history. I think that's how most people get into it to start with is, as you say, is through historical movies or, or historical fiction. And I love the way that you just described that um, as, as showing people that they have a place in history and that they have a place in making history. Yeah. Um, I think that's yeah. fantastic. Everyone does, you know, whether it's thinking about like home cooked meals from, you know, that your grandmother used to make you, that her grandmother used to make her, everybody has something of the past. And I think it's about um, owning that and going, this is my version, this is my way in and opening that discussion. Because I think there are a lot of people, a lot of young people who want to have that discussion, but they just don't know how to do it. 
That's wonderful. And, and that will be available later this year, you said? Yes, that's coming out in September. Fantastic. We'll watch out for that. All right. I have um, a few quick fire questions for you. Um, so the idea is to answer these off the top of your head, though, feel free to give explanations for what it is that you say. All right. First quick fire question. What is the worst thing we'd find in your browser history? Thanks to your research. Oh, thanks to my research. As a no, I, I added that just to be, <laughs> just to be safe. <laughs> I was about to say probably the amount I spend on nice clothes. <laughs> um, that's my that's my other guilty pleasure. I do love, I do love fashion. Um, ooh, to do with my research. Mm, what's the worst thing we're gonna find on there? Were you googling bubonic plague pictures or? Uh, maybe something like, do I say hung, drawn, and quartered, or hanged, drawn, and quartered? That's a tough one. Yeah, yeah. and then the worst is then you end up with pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah or um yeah there's there was another one where i had to research whether it was indeed the case that um tax collectors had to inspect girls virginities in the lead up to the peasants revolt which i i can't remember i don't really remember if that pulled up anything particularly hideous but i do remember typing it in was, was it true did they have to yeah. Yeah, they did. I think they did. Yeah. Whether they had to or not is a good question. But um, uh, they did do it. <laughs> I mean, they did. Yes. Oh, God. Um, in your role as researcher and producer, is there a period that you're sick of working on? And why is it the Tudor period? <laughs> do you know what? Funnily enough, I've not actually worked on the Tudors, but I'm just really sick of the Tudors anyway. We know. It's okay. <laughs> Um, no, I think oh, the worst, when I have to do anything, if I see anything on like late American political history around the Trump stuff, I had to do a series on that. And that was a real challenge because I just didn't understand American politics and just wrapping my head around that was hard work. Um, so it's, I think, you know, it's a little bit like art, like history is some things interest people and some things just don't and that's just one period of history that if someone was like there's this great movie on it i'd be like oh all right <laughs> so that's sort of <laughs> well, we do sort of especially over the last five or so years we have been inundated as well yeah. with american politics so, so yeah i'm so tired of thinking about the who was in the white house yeah <laughs> All right, this, this might be um, an unfair question, so feel free to opt out. Battle of the Dans, who wins, Dan Jones or Dan Snow? No. Oh, but what's the context? <laughs> they're, they're battling. Oh, over we're going, are we going on like <laughs> ability, looks, writing? I, I, it's written down in front of me, Battle of the Dans, Dan Jones or Dan Snow. <laughs> Do you know what? <laughs> I really love both of them. I think they're both wonderful people dan snow is probably the nicest man i've ever known and he is also one of probably the most hard-working man i've ever i've ever met he's does so much and he's so generous with his time with his energy he's got so much energy i don't know how he does it um and he's lovely dan jones i don't think i honestly don't think i would be have written my book without dan jones's support so you know these are two really really good guys who are very different and give very different things to the field so i think i did, I did notice that dan jones endorsed the book as well so <laughs> we have to we have to make sure yeah i can't be like oh definitely dan snow um no no no. they both are they're both great they're really different they're just really different people as well they're very different characters they give they give very different um they give very different perspectives on things so, um, so not all dans are the same is what you're saying not all dance are the same, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, last last quick fire. Um, I, I was so I'd usually ask a time machine question, but I'm I'm going to change it up a bit. Um, given that you work on war and epidemics, um, <laughs> you're given a time machine. What year do you definitely not set it to? Oh, do I not set it to? Not set it to. Probably yeah. thirteen. What, what should we all avoid? Thirteen forty nine. Probably thirteen forty eight. Okay. That was a pretty hideous year. Or actually 1361, because 1348-9 always gets the rap as the Black Death. But the Black Death came back many times, and 1361 was actually a pretty hideous wave. And that killed a lot of um, a lot of little children. 
Well, let's hope that. Sorry, that was a really macabre, <laughs> dark note to end on. <laughs> we were we were getting messages of hope from you a few minutes ago. So. <laughs> If I could go, if I could go back in time, though, I'd go back to 1961 and I would be sitting and listening to What Is History lectures delivered at Cambridge University by my great grandfather. Are there notes of people who were at those lectures? That's a really good question. I don't even know. I hadn't thought about that. Possibly. I know people um, sometimes when I'm teaching Hegel, there are students took notes of of Hegel and some of them are really funny and they're really helpful for interpreting him because you can't interpret Hegel otherwise. Um, so I just was wondering if I, I wonder oh. if there's some archival work or or oral histories or things like that around. That's around. a really interesting question. I've read all of the sort of criticisms around it when it first came out, but I've not actually thought about who might have recorded any notes uh, at the original lectures. That's fascinating. There you go. Well, maybe we'll find out. All right. To end, I've got three questions um, that I'm going to ask uh, every of my every one of my guests. Um, these don't have to be quick fire, so you can you can take a breath. What is your favorite primary source that you have worked on? Oh, um, oh gosh, that's really hard. I loved all the D- Duchy of Lancaster records, the National Archives, and Mike. So there are a couple of things. So I love John, looking at John of Gaunt's original register because I ha- I have a printed I have the printed volumes of it. Um, so it's you know, it's not uh, it's not in English, but it is transcribed. It's from its original paleography. But um, I loved seeing that in its original form, seeing the way it was laid out, and being able to sort of distinguish what was what. Um, but I also loved going through. They had these like boxes that nobody had really gone through, and my fingers were so black, as anybody knows if you worked in like in archives. Um, and there was this vellum. It was like a little vellum pouch for collecting various um rolls and it was probably only the size of like a small clutch bag now and it was just like a little leather kind of drawstring pouch i loved i loved looking at that um and finding that was where people that was where i think it was like i know somebody like a bailiff would collect the um the rents um or collect some of the paperwork that came with that um and then i loved looking at the changes of seals so um I think seals can be really interesting as well, just to sort of see a very vis- visual representation of the more kind of boring and linear kind of uh, uh, administrative work. I think that they can be fascinating. That's really interesting because you picked on a few things there where um, sort of uh, traditional archival sources um, lean into material history yeah. as well, right? You know, waxes and and these these bags. I've I've had to go through a few at the National Archive as well. Those those are things that are, are used. They're not just pieces of paper that people are recording. Yeah. Dates, um, they're, they're, they're used objects. And yeah, it, it, it creates this real connection with the past, doesn't it? But... Yeah, and they're a bit scrappy as well. And I quite like that sort of sense of like just scrappiness and a quick, a quick doodle or a quick jot down of something. Um, it's harder to read <laughs> than these lovely secretary <laughs> hand um, kind of like indentures but um but it is fun to find it's fun to rifle through and actually do you know what even if you don't really know what it says if you don't really understand it to its full extent i still think being immersed within it you get gives you some kind of understanding gosh i miss archives hopefully soon (laughs) what advice uh would you give to a historian just starting out Hmm. I think it really depends on what you want to do. I get asked a lot about wanting to do public history and being on TV or in, there's a lot of conflict around kind of what, what route you go in academia or that. And I think I would say be true to yourself, be true to what you think your skills are and what you're good at, what you're passionate about. Don't try and fit into an existing mold I found when I was starting out it was kind of like you either work in a university or you do or you're Dan Snow um and so I took it took me a really long time to actually really enjoy and embrace being a producer and looking at history in that way um for tv but I also really appreciate and I indulge in and enjoy the academic study and the writing and the narrative side too so I think you can be many different things but just be true to what you enjoy and even if you are an academic and you want to you know delve into that academic history and that critical thought and um an analysis don't feel like you've got to stand in front of a camera because that's what other people want to do 
um, it's not for everyone. So I think just being true to yourself and and what it is that you're interested in and where your skills lie. It's brilliant advice. Um, I think we all need to be reminded of that every once yeah. in a while. It's a really and... hard, it's a really, really hard issue, I think, for many, for many people. And I've definitely struggled with it as well. It's where do you fit? And actually, I think the idea is you don't have to fit. You know, there's this thing they call in LA. They call people quite comfortably, and it's actually a compliment. It's a multi-hyphenate, and that's like where you do multi different things. You don't just do one thing; you do lots of different things. And you're like, well, I'm a I'm a researcher. I'm a podcast host. I'm a this and that. And I think that's yet to cotton on here. I think it's kind of still. I don't know. There's this very kind of English. Um, mentality British mentality of well I go to work and I sit down and I do my job and, and that's what I have to do and it feels very uncomfortable I think for a lot of people when you've got people saying well I do this and I do that and I do that um, and I think that we've got a long way to go just sort of in our country really kind of embracing that sense of diversity and multiple skills and interests last question what are you working on next Probably nothing. You've just finished a whole bunch. You should have a holiday. <laughs> but uh, I am I'm looking to stay within the 14th century. Um, yeah, so watch this space. So it's going to be that it, I'm going to be within staying within the 14th century. It's going to be hopefully another book. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say what, what exactly it's going to be yet because it's still very early days. But it's going to be in the 14th century. It's going to uh, be about some things that we've talked about. Um, and I'm going to be working on my doctorate and really enjoying the research that goes into that and also applying that research to something that is readable because, you know, there will be certainly lots more readable history that is, when I say readable, I mean popular narrative history that is um, that I produce. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Helen, uh, for that journey through the past and through your career and, and for your advice as well. Just a reminder that if you want to hear more conversations with history makers like Helen Carr, do subscribe to Primary Sources Podcast and follow us on Instagram and Twitter, where you can also suggest future guests and send along quickfire questions to grill them with. Thank you for listening to Primary Sources. Mm -hmm.